Welcome to HeartTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the July garden checklist video. I do one of these each month just to tell you the things that I have going on in my garden here in Raleigh, North Carolina, Zone 7B. Uh, I, a couple years ago, I did a more extensive uh, July list of all the things you might be thinking about doing if you want to go back and take a look at that video. Currently, I'm just kind of going through what I'm doing here uh, in my area. And I always kick these videos off talking about planting. Well, July is not a month that a lot of people are probably going to be out digging holes uh, and planting things. Um, I do. Um, if, if it's a kind of a, you know, a, a tougher plant, uh, I don't mind digging a hole and putting it in the ground uh, at all. Uh, things that you know might be finicky. Somebody asked me a question the other day about planting a Daphne in the middle of summer, and I know that plant can be a little bit finicky, um, you know, when it's when it's when it's planted and. Those are things I'm going to avoid. So if you know it's something that's, you know, you know, kind of finicky, you might want to hold it and save it till fall. Another thing is, you might be shopping for plants, and something like this hydrangea, white wedding hydrangea, this hydrangea paniculata, might be in full flower. Um, it's going to be very stressful to put this plant in the ground in July in full flower like this. And so this might be a plant that I would enjoy the flowers on. Once they start to fade, you can cut it back some and then put it in the ground. Um, otherwise, you're probably going to lose the flowers anyway in the transition of planting it. So, uh, you know, just base it on that. If it's a pretty tough plant, I'll still stick it in the ground. Typically, I'll give it a little bit of a haircut, you know, just barely tip prune it, and that will reduce some of the it trying to grow at the same time you're transplanting it. If it's in flower, I'm going to hold it to the side. If it's marginal, again, I'm going to just hold it to the side uh, and wait until early fall or the, you know, the summer relents a little bit. Um, I understand that people don't necessarily want to be out when it's, you know, when it's, when it's this hot. You can do some division on some of your perennials uh, that are crowded. So, you know, sometimes, you know, perennials will come up in the you know, their third, fourth year in the ground, and they're almost overcrowded, and they're not performing as well as they did uh, in the past. That could be Shasta daisies, you know, anything like that. Um, those can be uh, dug up this time of year and divided. I wouldn't do it in the middle of the day, you know, when the sun's up above your head, um, or you might pick a day on the calendar when it's, you know, at slightly cooler than it is, you know, other days. But you can dig some of those things out, divide them, um, and uh, this is a good, it's a good month to do that while you can see them and if you're seeing them underperform from years past. A couple other things to think about in July, if you wanna do any propagation, uh, this is definitely the month to be, make new plants. Um, I've got, uh, working on a couple propagation projects here that you guys will see the videos uh, later in the summer, some easy techniques for propagating, but I have a propagation playlist on the channel if you wanna learn all kinds of different techniques for propagating your plants, making more of them for free, or, or low, you know, low, certainly lower cost than buying uh, new ones. One other thing, um, if you're in the south here, uh, this, is, this is a good month to think about. If you've got a small area you want to sod, uh, this is zoysia grass um, that I'm standing on right here. Uh, uh, the warm season grasses, this is, this is if, if you're going to sod them, this is a pretty good month to do that. You've got to do a lot of watering, and obviously you're going to do a lot of sweating uh, in the process of putting it in, but this would be a good time to, uh, to sod some of those spaces that need sodding. Things like cosmos and zinnias, uh, annuals, uh, flowers that I do from seed, uh, tend to burn out here in the south uh, by mid to late summer. If you wanna do a second round of them, now would be the time to do the uh, seeds uh, for them. You can start them indoors pretty easily or you can direct seed either one of them. But these beautiful zinnias, which are just showing off like crazy right now, Again, after about another month, um, they will start to slow down, but I could, again, I could just come back in here and plant some seedlings amongst them and they would bloom right, the next round would bloom right through the fall. A few other seed related things uh, for July. Uh, my cool season vegetables that I had for the, that I had for the spring, like lettuce and uh, broccoli, kale, uh, those kinds of things, uh, they will bolt. Um, typically right here either at the end of June or the beginning of July they'll they'll send up their flower spikes and then they'll set seed so I've left some of them in place and we'll be gathering that seed it's almost time to actually do those seeds for fall sometimes toward the end of July uh, first of August for me uh, is when I'll start the broccoli seed lettuce seed all of those things that will go into the fall um, to my fall garden in the meantime, though, um, I've left, there's a little bit of space in my summer garden for some other things, and I've done that on purpose. So I didn't plant all the zucchini I'm going to plant for the year or all the, um, 
all the cucumbers, all the tomatoes. I've left a little space here so I could come back in in the middle of summer and plant a second round, a few additional plants. Uh, and those plants should last right into the fall where some of this stuff I planted very early in the season uh, may burn out uh, between now and then. One other seed, seed thing is toward the end of July, you can start your fall flower seeds. So if you're in the south here and you wanna have pansies through the winter, uh, snapdragons, dianthus, some of the winter flowering things that we can have here, July, the end of July, 1st of August is the time to start those seeds. Your vining things like your cucumbers and uh, tomatoes, uh, it's kind of hard to stay on top of uh, making sure you're, uh, you know, keeping them, keeping them staked properly, uh, but it is something you need to stay on top of. In terms of your second round of uh, vegetable planting, some, on tomatoes, uh, the tomatoes get suckers, which come up, you know, this is, this is the main part of the, of the vine right here, and you always get this side branching then you'll get another side branch that typically has the flowers, this one right there where you have the flowers. This part that comes up at like a 45 or you know maybe 30 degree angle out of the side is called a sucker. We need to desucker our tomatoes. In the process of desuckering our tomatoes, frequently you can just plant this. Um, you, can dig, you can dig a small trench and plant this, water it in for a few days, and typically these will just root in. So you don't have to go and buy additional tomato plants. Several of the things in your garden are like that. Cucumbers, you can, you can, take, um, you can take a piece off and easily root them. Uh, peppers, all of these things are easily rooted, especially on these kind of softwood cuttings. Uh, you, can, you can root them on a, on a ledge on your porch, uh, not in the direct sun, you know, in a small amount of moist um, uh, soil, get them rooted and put them in the ground. Most of them will root readily. You don't have to root them 100%. If you took 10 cuttings and you rooted five, Great, five free plants. And so don't be discouraged if you're not rooting 100% on them. But these suckers are just clones of that exact um, tomato plant. So you don't have to buy them again. Sometime in July, I'll put a second application of fertilizer on my vegetable garden. I don't do a lot of fertilizing in this landscape. And uh, none of the shrubs or perennials uh, get any additional fertilizer. If the fertilizer was done, I did one application of a organic fertilizer early in the season. Then the compost and the mulch, you know, those things breaking down the, um, you know, keeping the ground covered, which I always talk about, uh, is the most important thing really. And those, those things breaking down are feeding my plants. The vegetables though, they're producing a lot and I'm taking a lot out of here. And so I will give this a second application of a, again, an organic fertilizer, not a whole lot. I never use the full rate, whatever the bag says, I'm probably using two thirds of that amount, something like that. Uh, again, just a, just a small amount here in midsummer. The, um, if you're getting your tomatoes cracking a lot, uh, you may be overwatering them. You may want to back off the water a little bit. We'll always get some, uh, sometime during the summer here, especially, you know, in the Southeast where we can get so many thunderstorms during the summer. Hopefully we're getting a few thunderstorms. Hopefully it's raining. Uh, if it rains for two or three days in a row, your tomatoes uh, can start cracking, you know, just from the amount of water uh, that's, in, that's in the plant. You may want to start picking them a little earlier uh, before, before that cracking takes place. That, that, but that event happens every summer for me pretty much that, you know, I get some cracking tomatoes, but I don't, I don't worry about it. I'll just pick them a little earlier if we get a rain. Make sure you are picking <laughs> in your garden. It's one of the keys to keep everything blooming uh, and keep everything producing. Uh, if they think they're setting seeds, uh, they will quit on you. So even if you're going out of town, going on vacation, you know, have a neighbor come over here and pick it uh, and uh, make sure that they're, you know, you're constantly taking finished produce off the plants. July is definitely potato harvesting season here uh, in the Southeast. I've already flipped over, I, I do mine in grow bags. If you follow along with the channel, I've already flipped over five or six bags and gotten quite a few. I wait for the foliage to die mostly back. I've got a few bags here that hasn't happened yet, but these will be harvested here in the uh, next few weeks. Again, once the foliage uh, dies back, you can take potatoes one of the one or two or three or four or five of the potatoes you pull out of the bags and put them right back in and into the same compost uh, and just replant them and uh, they'll actually come back up toward the end of summer and produce another crop in the fall if you want to do that so um, you know that is an option uh, to get two rounds of uh, potatoes out of your grow bags and that same compost and i end up dumping that compost back in the garden at some point anyway so uh, it gets several several uses one other point in the vegetable garden is when you hit periods of time where it's 95 
degrees outside. Your garden may slow down some on you. Uh, don't give up on it. Keep watering it. Keep doing maintenance on it. Keep it weed free. Uh, and uh, typically toward later in the summer, uh, as, the, as the days shorten and the, uh, and the days get slightly cooler, uh, they'll pick back up the pace and uh, give you some additional food. Let's talk about summer pruning uh, for a minute. I'll start on shrubs. Most of your early season flowering shrubs, let's take azaleas uh, as an example of that. Uh, we're pretty much past the point where you'd want to do uh, any pruning on them at this point. They've, they're in the process of setting their flower buds for next season. These are encore azaleas and these are going to bloom in the fall, so I definitely don't want to be blooming, uh, pruning on these. But they needed to be done pretty close pretty closely after they had finished flowering. You probably have about 60, uh, maybe 90 days there where you can prune them. I think we're past, you know, out past that. So that's any of the super early season flowering things. Your things that have, have bloomed later than that or are summer flowering, uh, like this hydrangea behind me, uh, as these fade, uh, you can prune you know, do a little bit of pruning on them uh, and it would be the appropriate time to do that uh, as they're finishing flowering. If you have any rejuvenative pruning to do, meaning you got a big giant holly, you know, some sort of evergreen shrub um, like this osmanthus behind me. Osmanthus blooms in the fall, so I wouldn't prune it, but as an example of just a large evergreen beast that needs to be gotten under control, uh, really need to do it by mid-July if you're going to do it. So any of that rejuvenative pruning where you're just going to just go out and take three quarters of the plant back just because it's gotten out of control and you need to reset it, uh, that needs to be done pretty early um, in the summer. Otherwise, you, you need plenty of time for that new growth to come out on it and harden off before it goes into that first winter. So you'll end up double down, having the stress of having pruned it followed by you know serious winter damage on it potentially so if you do have any of that kind of pruning to do do it early by mid-july for sure so let's talk about annual and uh, perennial pruning you can see all the bees that are on this summer jewels salvia uh, sometimes i shoot the videos at times of days when the bees aren't out but you get to see it this time uh, how crazy and manic and there's a ton of other pollinators on here you can see the bees easily but there's also all kinds of little native small insects that uh, that pollinate these. When I'm, the, these annuals are stretching a bit and I need to do some pruning on them, but what, the way I go about it is I'll prune about a third of them at the time so that I'm not taking away this nectar source from all of these uh, pollinators. But I'll go through, you know, when the bees aren't on them and I'll just hold, kind of hold the plant together and, you know, cut the flower stalks off of them. Within a week or two, you know, they're right back up uh, flowering again, but that keeps them fuller keeps them uh, in good shape where they can bloom right up, right up through the fall and I can continue to see this show along here. You're on your perennial things like the dahlias back here where a, a flower has completely finished, uh, you know, I can, I can go down here and just deadhead these just like I was talking about on, on your vegetables, on your vegetable plants in order to keep them flowering, keep them producing, you know, taking off the the fruit in that case, um, but spent flowers, you can do the same thing on, on your perennials. I play a delicate balance with this because I love the goldfinches out here and the goldfinches love the dahlia seed. Uh, they love my verbena bonariensis seed. They love the uh, zinnia seeds, the coneflower seeds, the black eyed Susan seed. So there's, you can see, uh, so I'm playing a delicate balance with this. I want to keep them blooming, but I also want to offer a few seeds uh, for them as well. So I choose kind of not to deadhead my cone flowers, and I'm probably going to get a slightly shorter season than I would if I was deadheading them. But I, again, I love to see the uh, goldfinches on there. So I leave some for the birds and uh, prune some back uh, just to keep them flowering. A couple other pruning notes before we move on. If you have fall blooming mums, asters, sedum, uh, in early July, you can cut those things uh, down maybe a third, and that will produce additional branching that will have them blooming much fuller. Uh, into the fall, so any of those you can go out and do. Be checking the base of your plants for suckers. If you have crepe myrtles, if you did any pruning in the winter time, a lot of times that will force growth down at the bottom of them, or what we call suckers. A lot of your plants will do that. You can look down at the base of your shrubs and see if they're or, and trees and see if they've got any suckers on them. Definitely be taking those off. They're just taking energy away from the plant, especially on something like a crepe myrtle where all the flowering is up at the top. You know, a lot of that energy is you know just being taken away from it with those suckers on the bottom. I talked about fertilizing the vegetable garden. Uh, the only other things that I would be fertilizing again would be containers. 
Uh, so anything I have in the uh, landscape in a container, I'll do a second fertilizing on. Uh, hanging baskets, you know, anything that's kind of contained. Um, and again, my annual plants that are out in the uh, vegetable garden. If you find your annual beds are kind of slowing down a bit, um, you know, you can give those a second round. But I'll tell you, the annuals that you just looked at, that spot was fertilized um, way back in early February or late January. It has not been fertilized again. You do not need as much fertilizer as people are telling you for these flowering plants to get them to flower like you see in my videos. Um, they are fertilized once and then it's the combination of compost and the organic material that's been added to the soil that's keeping these things growing um, and performing like they are. But again, if they start slowing down and I see that, I will fertilize them uh, for a second time. I realize it's very hot uh, in July. And so a lot of the, you know, the planting things that I've talked about, you know, those aren't the things people may be doing in the garden, but the things you do really need to concentrate on uh, during the, the heat of the summer, uh, where we are at this point, uh, is number one, weeding. You know, little tiny small weeds that seem benign in the garden. Uh, you know, you're a couple rainstorms or a couple thunderstorms away from those things just exploding. Uh, they sit there, you know, they typically germinate, they sit there, they just kind of wait for the right conditions. And so you can go from a few weeds in a bed to many giant weeds that are seeding themselves rather quickly. So, you know, staying on top of the weeding early in the morning, super important. Mulching. You know, there's not a video that goes by that I'm not going to talk about keeping the ground covered. You know, I'm talking about using less fertilizer, um, but mulch is fertilizer. It's also an insulator for the roots so that we're keeping our, you know, keeping our roots cool. I'm going to give you one warning on summer mulching, though. If you get a load of mulch dropped onto your driveway in the full sun, it likely came from a place in the full sun uh, at, the, at the mulch, wherever the mulch place is and now it's on your driveway in the full sun, it can really heat up. It's got a little bit of moisture in it and it can really start to compost very quickly. Uh, and putting that hot mulch out in the middle of a 95 degree day can be potentially damaging to your plants. So uh, have them dump it in a shady space. It might be easier for you to work anyway, uh, or get it out as fast as possible, you know, before it starts heating up. But if you've ever reached into a pile of mulch in the sun, on a summer day, any day of the year, really, it can be composting. But in the summer, it can, and you put your hand in it, it can be really, really hot. Might be a good idea to take the wheelbarrow, dump some wheelbarrow loads here and there where you're going to be mulching, let it cool off a little, and then rake it out uh, around your plants. So just, just a warning of summertime mulching uh, that you, you can damage with heat. And then of course watering. Uh, watering is of course, you know, the key, the key. Anything that you've got that's newer, been newly planted in the last year that wilts on you every afternoon, and there's always something in the landscape that does this, uh, it might be a good idea just to go out and tip prune those things a little bit. Just slow them down. This is, some, this is a strategy I used to use at my nursery. We might have 10,000 plants in a bed, in a 200, you know, 300 foot long bed might be 10,000 plants and there'd be one or two groups of plants in that bed that were demanding water twice a day where everything else wanted water once a day. I can't afford to move those things, you know, uh, to another bed and water them more. So our strategy was always just to go out and take about 20% of the top of the plant off with some, with some pruning shears very quickly and easily we could reduce the demand that plant had for water. You can do the exact same thing in a landscape. Uh, also, if you've plant, especially things with like hydrangeas, which I showed earlier, if they're wilting every single afternoon and they're newly planted, it might be a good idea this first year to take those flowers off um, for the long-term health of the plant. When you are watering, water deeply and try to water as little as possible. Some, a little bit of early afternoon wilt uh, is not the worst thing in the world uh, on a plant. Um, if it's severe, you know, water it, but uh, the stress that that plant's un going through, and not a tremendous amount of stress, but a little bit of stress on your plants will encourage them to root out into the surrounding soil and get out looking for water. If you baby them and baby them and baby them and water, you know, keep watering them, they will not root out into the surrounding soil. I have dug plants out of foundation areas uh, of houses that have, are 10 years old where the plants had not really rooted out. They had an irrigation system that watered on a timer and the plant really had no reason to get out into the surrounding area. So stress them just a bit uh, is, my, uh, is my strategy for getting them to actually root out. This is zoysia 
that I sodded uh, a couple of years ago. This is a creeping grass. If you're in the south here and you have one of these creeping grasses like zoysia, bermuda, centipede, they will try to creep into your bed. So make sure you're staying on top of the bed edging. I actually just come through here and use my uh, weed eater on its side and cut this trench each time. Uh, these annuals, unfortunately, are gonna have to be pulled back, but you can see underneath it there where that's creeping up into the bed. So I need to take care of that, otherwise it will run up in there completely. One other note on your turf is make sure you're mowing on a, the highest recommended rate uh, during the uh, peak of the summertime. So whatever type of turf you have, you know, you can quickly Google what's the mowing height for it. And let's say it was fescue and it was recommended two and a half inches to four inches or something like that. I'd be mowing at four inches here in the uh, peak of the summer. It definitely helps hold in some moisture near the ground and uh, prevents that kind of root scalding that can happen when you mow uh, on these really hot, dry days. I talked about earlier the potatoes. Um, garlic and onions are another thing that are um, probably ready to uh, harvest in our area as well. I just got my garlic here in the last week of June, uh, but at some time around this period of time, once that foliage um, has almost died back, it's time to um, uproot those, uh, those root vegetables uh, as well, or those bulb, uh, bulbous vegetables. Um, birds, I mean, you can probably hear in all of my videos the birds uh, that are in the area. I have bird feeders. Uh, I have, um, uh, again, leaving seeds for the, for the seed eating, um, for, for the seed eating birds. Uh, a lot of my insect related issues are being taken care of by birds. And so having a bird bath, keeping a space where they can come and clean themselves, uh, make it a, making it a welcoming space. Uh, birds can do a lot of the gardening work for you, believe it or not. If you have a bird house and you've had, a, you've had birds in it already, uh, you may go in there and go ahead and clean it up because they'll have a second round of uh, egg laying potentially. Uh, be careful when you're out pruning. I had a shrub, um, you know, I was pruning earlier in a pruning video earlier in the spring and found a bird nest in it. And I just, you know, walked away from it. I didn't continue pruning it. Uh, let, let, them, let them go through the process and then come back to it later uh, and finish pruning that plant. You may also want to think about adding a bat house. Uh, if you have a tree someplace in the yard that, um, is a good spot to put one. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty good at eliminating mosquitoes. And then of course, going through your yard and making sure all the pots are dumped and um, you know, you, anything that holds water, make sure you're flipping it over. Uh, your bird bath, make sure you're you know, putting fresh water in it consistently. Or you can get, there's a little stirrer thing you can get. Um, Dr. Armitage had one, uh, and I don't know if we showed it in one of the videos, but it just keeps the water turning. Uh, in your uh, bird bath. Um, and it was an inexpensive thing. I think he got on uh, Amazon, but uh, can prevent mosquitoes from coming uh, in, your, uh, in your bird bath water as well. I get just hundreds and hundreds of questions in the early part of the summer up through midsummer about pest. I mean, uh, this is the pest arrive in your garden before the beneficials. And so um, I, I try to be as patient as I can you know, with things like aphids and mealybugs and those kinds of things, because, you know, the, um, the ladybugs aren't going to show up before, you know, the aphids show up. So, you know, um, I let nature take its course. I don't do any spraying. Any spraying I did for aphids or mealybugs or any of those things would be disruptive to the entire process of allowing the beneficials to come in and take care of some of those things. I don't have a lot of pests. And one of the reasons is, diver, you know, the diversity that's in this garden as well. Um, you know, there's, you know, they're not just the, the plants to lure in the bees, which I'm absolutely surrounded by right now, but I also have the host plants, you know, for the caterpillars as well, like this bronze fennel. Um, you know, you can, you can look those up. You know, some of the plants that you can add parsley um, and asclepius um, or, or butterfly weed uh, that you can add to your landscape to, you know, get the host plants for these uh, pollinators as well. Writing down your successes and failures, this is the month where you're gonna know a lot about the things that you seeded during the winter time, whether they perform well in your garden or not. Make sure you're writing those things down and you're, or I go ahead and order my fall vegetable seeds now. I will probably start ordering my spring flowers for next year as well. So, you know, write down what's working for you, what's not, um, some things you wanna add. Maybe you're watching my videos or somebody else's videos and you're seeing things that they did from seed that they're having success with. You know, write, make sure you're taking those notes. And then again, I always talk about in these videos, 
it's a great time to get out and look in gardens this time of year. Go to botanic gardens that are near you, interesting gardens that are near you, because I think you'll find that at a really tough time of year that you think is probably impossible to have really nice things, that there are some things that will perform well in those tough conditions in your area. So get out and take a look at those spaces. Thank you guys so much for following along with these uh, monthly checklist videos. I'll be back in August with another one and uh, stay out of the midday heat and uh, get these tasks done in the early morning or late in the evening. Thanks for watching.